Cowan's Big Rig Boot Camp will be coming to you live Friday, June 17, 2022, from historic downtown San Antonio, Texas. In person seating is already at capacity, so act now and secure your virtual spot to our professionally produced seminar available via Zoom webinar. Visit TrialLawyerNation.com and click Seminar in our menu to join the in-person waitlist or register for virtual attendance. And to all those who already registered, be sure to contact Allison Bradley to take advantage of our exclusive 50% discount on your hotel stay. Just email Allison at Allison at CowanLaw.com. That's A-L-L-I-S-O-N at CowanLaw.com. Register now and we'll see you there. This is Michael Cowan, and welcome to Trial Lawyer Nation. You are the leader in the courtroom, and you want the jury to be looking to you for the answers. When you figure out your theory, never deviate. You want the facts to be consistent, complete, and credible. The defense has no problem running out the clock. Delay is the friend of the defense. It's tough to grow a firm by trying to hold on and micromanage. You've got to front load a simple structure for jurors to be able to hold on to. What types of creative things can we do as lawyers, even though we don't have a trial setting? Whatever you've got to do to make it real, you've got to do to make it real. But the person who needs convincing is you. Welcome to the award-winning podcast, Trial Lawyer Nation. Your source to win bigger verdicts, get more cases, and manage your law firm. And now, here's your host, noteworthy author, sought-after speaker, and renowned trial lawyer, Michael Cowan. Today on Trial Lawyer Nation, I'm excited to have a great guest and one of our few returning guests, and that's Keith Mitnick. Uh, Keith is one of the top trial lawyers in the country. He's out of Florida with the firm of Morgan & Morgan. He's got a couple of great books on trial work, uh, Don't Eat the Bruises, and the newer book, Deeper Cuts, as well as he's got a great podcast. He's got a list you can get on. He'll tell us all about it later. But Keith has done a lot for us, and I'm glad that you're taking the time to join us again today. Well, I'm glad to be here. I mentioned to Michael here before we came on the air that I have never seen the kind of loyalty and stay in power of a podcast as yours does. I have people from something I did before COVID on when I was on last time on a regular basis, emailing me asking to send some memo I referred to in there. And it's impressive that you're doing a service that's got that many people's interests. So I'm happy to come back on anytime. Well, thank you. Well, I want to just kind of jump right in since this is part two one thing that you've done that other people say is impossible to do is is getting full damages. Uh, some people say big money, but I think what's really what fair compensation yep. on cases where there's no obvious villain. You don't have like a corporation that chose to do something wrong or a drunk driver. What is it you do to get a jury to actually base the dollar number on the harms and not on what the defendant did wrong? Well, you've hit a hot button. Um, that is one that I have been... It's been a work in progress for years because we all know when you've got a sweet, listen, I just got a $2.62 million verdict on a rear end, decent property damage, minimally invasive, uh, two minimally invasive disc surgeries. Lady continued to work, no wage loss claim, defended across the board on everything you can imagine. And the lady that hit us was, uh, by what I could tell, a nice lady. Um, so I had no villain. And, you you know, that's a lot of money. Now, it's a lot of hurt for a lot of time, but you still are faced with that guy. Are they going to feel sorry for her? Are they going to feel bad for her? Are they going to hold it down because of it? Or are they going to just lack the motivation to, to, do, to, to get to what we thought was necessary to do justice for this injury? Um, and it's always a struggle. I sue cigarette companies, and that's a whole different animal. I don't yeah. need to stand up and say, look, these are the bad guys. They all know they are. Um, the biggest problem is people say, well, they can be the bad guy, but your client smoked all these years and they're not going to get a lot of money for it. So that's a problem in itself. But yeah. coming back to your question, it, let me, I'm going to lay out kind of a big picture of what goes on in my mind that the framework then becomes for a jury. Let's start at the highest level of it. I realize that what it's really about at the end of the day with that kind of case where it's, there's no punitive element to it at all. Uh, officially or unofficially, is having a jury recognize and embrace the concept of why we're here in the first place. 
which is to recognize fully and completely the value of what was taken in the way of health. And at its real core, the probably the, the one principle that I build everything around it is this saying I came up with years ago, and I, I can't tell you the number of times I've said it with a jury. It's not about how much she's going to get. It's about how much was taken, what's a fair value for what was lost. That galvanizes in a simple, catchy phrase. It isn't celebrating a pile of money. I got a big hole, Doug, and I'm never going to fill the hole. It's impossible. I'm always going to be in a deficit. But if we're serious about recognizing, and that sounds like an unimportant word. To me, it, it's, it's at the core of the, what the idea we're trying to get across the jury is that we're recognizing formally in this formal court proceeding the full value of what was taken in the way of health. And it's not about how much you're going to get. It's about how much was lost that'll never be recaptured. So when you think of that, it's not about how much you're going to get. It's about how much was taken. And we now get the jurors focus on we're not celebrating a pile of money. We are doing our best to do something we treasure in America called justice in the only way we can do it, because we can't go back in time and erase it. The only way we can do it is to recognize it with dollars. What was it worth? And if we're going to go, if we believe in that, then we got to fully recognize it, because what good is it to partially recognize it? That's more of an insult than a, than a just result. So. Then another thing that came to me fairly recently, probably within the last year, I've said this many times, and I made a change for this very thing you're asking a question about, a constant recognition of how do I get the jury to fully appreciate what they're doing is important and why they're doing it, and it's not to punish. So I've said for years, in America, we don't no longer believe in eye for an eye justice, the old way. That's that is brutal. We don't do that. That's barbaric. But we also don't believe in turning a blind eye to justice because that's no justice at all. So what do we do? We gather people from the community to come and sit in judgment to determine what is a fair and reasonable amount for what was taken in the way of health. Not how much someone's going to get, but what was taken by no fault of their own and is never coming back. Now, that's always felt good to me. But there was a piece missing. And here's the new piece that came out of really some soul searching on this very issue we all struggle with. And it is, I realized it seemed to me right. And I wrote it up, but before I sent it, I don't like to send something that I, it sounded good to me, but it isn't true. So I actually did some internet search and it, lo and behold, it was exactly true. What I thought is the old days when we did eye for an eye justice, it probably wasn't so much about punishment as it was full and complete recognition. And what better way to recognize the value it was taken is to take it from you. Now there's going to be no question to you for sure. And the community that's watching goes, I, that is a very vivid recognition. You shouldn't be taking someone's eye because it's horrible. Now we're going to make sure everyone gets it's horrible. We're going to take your eye. And it left such an impression that we were recognizing for the good of the community as well as the fairness to this individual, full value, not a half value of what was taken. So I thought of it, and then I went on the internet and searched what eye for an eye, and sure enough, I found some biblical scholar writing on it, and he said almost exactly what I said. Wow. He, he said that they had a judge or somebody, you know, that was an official would make this determination. And it wasn't about punishment. It was important to the community to fully recognize when someone, and then they had a list, actually, it's not just eye for an eye. It's, you know, down and take a limb and it lists a bunch of things. If you take the whole same, then the community benefits by understanding this person has lost something of great treasure to them. And we now recognize it. Why? Not so you're going to get punished, so we are careful we don't do that to another. And I thought, my gosh, how did I miss this all these years? So now let me convert that thought process verified by a little research and how that comes to a jury. So I do the same thing, but I add a piece. I, I, I won't go back over the whole thing, but what I say, and then when I get to the end of, but so we no longer do the old way of eye for an eye justice because that's barbaric. 
what we do is gather people from the community and da 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 da. Then I go back and say, however, what is really important is to realize while the method we used from the old days of eye for an eye justice, we no longer do because we do it in a civilized way. The underlying principle is alive and well and is equally important today. Every bit as important today as it was back when they did it in that more harsh way. Because, and then I explained the purpose of it wasn't to punish, it was to recognize. And the idea here, and now that we do in this civilized way in our society, we have people come from the community, sit as a group of appraisers and assess what is a fair and full value for what was taken in the way of health. We do not diminish it. We do not run scared of it because while we don't take an eye, we don't go to them and say, we're going to take your wife's life or take your eyes. We don't do that anymore. We don't even a little bit reduce the importance of completely recognizing it, even though we've converted to recognizing it with dollars and cents. We, If you start bringing it down, it would be like someone came in and took someone's eye and all we did was slap them on the cheek. The whole principle would go out the window. So we have to take it serious. And I do that in jury selection. I'll ask people, what do you, and then I add in. I, and this is new. This is really kind of hot off the press and stuff. This isn't even in the latest book. I used to, when I did Vordire on this and all the other subjects, I, I used to believe in getting a big discussion going, getting to know them. Um, I didn't target topics as much as get to know. I realized that didn't work anymore. I, they love me. I love them. I knew a lot about them. And what I knew was I'm not going to win with this group of people. <laughs> so that didn't do me a lot of good. So I converted it in this very targeted bias busting, I call it, quick, laser sharp bias busting process where I educate them on the bias. We, I, I point out the topic. I establish a, a record of, of what's necessary under the law of the venue to get cause challenges so I can eliminate good people who just aren't good for this case. And now I've got a fair shake and I don't have enough peremptories to do that, but I can do it quickly and very effectively. There's one flaw in my system. When you get near the end, it almost always happens. We've gotten rid of all these people. I know I like these people. And then wherever we're at, three, four, however peremptories you got, there's almost always one or two more left over than you got. Yeah. And now we're trying to prioritize where are those peremptories going? And the same question comes up over and over in my system. It is the one flaw. And I think I've, I've come up with a fix. The flaw is we always end up going, we don't know that much about them. And why don't we? Because I didn't have this big open forum. So I tried a few years ago doing the open forum and then going into mine. Then, but the problem is it felt like after the big open forum, and my system didn't work as smoothly to establish the cause challenges. Or a judge would start jumping on your behind because you've already been going for 30 minutes or so, and now I'm just warming up. So then I did it the other way, which was I did mine, got all the cause challenges. Then I started the conversation with a more limited group because I knew by then who are the, I always had my trial partner say, give me the list of ones we need to know more about. And what I found is at the tail end, they're tired of talking and it's damn hard to get them engaged. So I would get, you know, so what do you think about this concept of, and that, that's, that makes sense to me. I say, well, <laughs> got any problem with it? Nope. And I'm like, all right. So here's what I'm doing currently. I call it the first big three. I set up my voir dire with my little story. And, and I, if we have time, I want to add in an addition to the little analogy at the front end that I really think is taking what was one of the things I've done that I feel most happy works so well for people. And it wasn't all mine. There's a guy named Jay Burke in, in or Florida who kind of started what he calls causes king. And I took his ideas and then took my style and, and then it evolved into what I now call my system. But I always have to take my hat off to Jay because he, he was the initial spark to that process. But in any event, I've got something I've added to it that takes it to an even better level um, that I want to add in that kind of fits this whole thing, but I'm getting off track. Let me come back to this. So what I, the, the, what I do now is I do the little lead in that gets jurors to understand how a little bit of uh, a bias can have an unintentional big impact and be the fairest person in the world. It's human nature. I do that. 
then I roll into the big three topics of bias, which are feelings against this kind of lawsuit, personal injury, product liability, medical malpractice, wrongful death, whatever it is. So I first find out if people have feelings against, and then I go through my system to try and establish cause. I go to question two of the big three, feelings against the non-economic or the pain and suffering or what I call human damage. Establish cause, I move to three. Three is feelings against large verdicts. Some people do not want to be associated with a, we're going to be talking about millions of dollars here because of the nature of injuries. I can't lay out why we're not allowed to do that, but we are. And they don't agree. That's part of why we need a jury. But I'm telling you, because I don't get to get into the evidence in the appropriate time and then say time out. Now I want to ask you about your feelings. So now's the only time. So I'm telling you, we're going to be talking about millions of dollars here because of the nature of the injuries. And I need to know some people do not want to be associated with a verdict of that size, no matter what the evidence says. It's against their beliefs. So they don't want to have to tell their friends, neighbors, coworkers, loved ones, they signed off on a verdict of that magnitude. So that that belief, and we have a right to your beliefs. You don't surrender your beliefs because you got a jury summons. Your only obligation is to show up and tell the truth. You can keep your beliefs. You got a right to them. And some people just, their beliefs are, I don't want to be associated with a verdict that size. And I feel strongly enough that it's going to create a bias against a large verdict like that. It may actually cause me to lower it below the evidence. If the number that the evidence supports is greater than my beliefs. Does everybody understand? Yes. So I want to ask you, how many of you say, in all honesty, I don't want to be associated with a verdict of that size. It's against my beliefs. And that may very well impact me in my decision over and above the evidence. In addition to the evidence, that bias may very well impact me. And I cannot assure anyone that I can lay it completely aside. I try, but I can't assure you. That's third of the big three. I found this what I believe is the right spot to now have a little bit of an open discussion. It's not so late that people are tired of talking and shut down. It's not so early that I may interfere with going through the big three. Right after that, I then I'm adding this in, some version of this. I say, I want some of you, and I really appreciate your candor. You've done the system proud and said, look, this just isn't the case for me because, but I want to ask some of the rest of you that didn't have those feelings. And I limit to, to, to that group. And I say, part of the idea behind all this is that it's, not how much someone's going to get. It's how much was taken. What's the fair value for what was lost? And some people hear that and they go, that makes sense to me. We're not counting how much money they're piling up. They left a big crater and we're trying to fill it in and they're never going to be home. They'd rather go back and not have it. But if we're serious about assessing this, if we're serious about recognizing it as a form of American justice, then we have to focus on it's not about how much you're going to get, it's how much was taken. Now, having said that, I know because I've done this for many years, folks. I've been, you can look at me and tell I've been doing it a while. Some people hear that and kind of roll their eyes and go, that's a fancy lawyer talk to try to get more money. You see what I'm saying? So I just want to know how you feel when you hear me say that. Just tell me. And now I get them talking. Now they're ready to talk. And I'm, A, I'm injecting that principle that I'm going to talk about later. And I look back and say, man, you've said that so many times. And you didn't even vet it with the jury. You didn't run it by to see their reaction. So A, it's smart to run it by, but B, now I'm gaining some information. So at the end, I'm not going, we don't know much about them. Because I'm asking the ones who are going to be in that pool at the end. Then I will add this other one if I feel I need to. Because it's another one I'm going to say to the jury, which fits right into this question you've asked. I'll say to the jury in, in closing argument, I'll say, If somebody were to say, that's more money than so-and-so makes in X amount of time, can you respectfully remind them, we're not here assessing what someone's income is. This isn't about someone's income from work. We're assessing something far more value. We're assessing health and the value of losing something as precious as that. So if someone were to bring that up, can you respectfully, and I say respectfully because no one is going to do it on purpose, but that is not a lawful measuring stick here in this case. And you respectfully remind them that's that's neither here nor there. It's got nothing to do with this. In fact, it would be wrong for us to be judging this on that. I do that in closing. So I've just moved that into this little slot in jury selection. So I'll say, sometimes when you talk about a significant amount of money, people say that's more money than so-and-so makes an X amount of time. The idea is we're not measuring someone else's income. 
we're measuring something far more treasured in, in, uh, by human beings, far more pressure, our health. But having said that, some people do feel, gosh, that's, that's so much money, and they, it's hard not to measure. Now, I know all of y'all know that someone's net worth has nothing to do with how much worth they put on their health. Someone who lives in the penthouse doesn't treasure their health any more than someone who maybe washes their car. Health doesn't tie to someone's net worth. It's treasured by all of us. But I'm not going to ask how many of you agree with that. No one's going to say, no, I think if you're rich, your health matters more. No one's going to say that. But nonetheless, when you get into a case and someone isn't wealthy, sometimes people start worrying about, well, that's more money than they make. And it's not the right way to go. But it happens because we're human beings. We're not perfect. And I'm going to be asking y'all not to do that. But before I do that, in fairness, I want to know how you feel about it. So how do you tell me? How do you feel about this idea that it's not about how much someone's going to make? It's how much was taken in the way of health. Yeah. Some people may go, boy, this, this slick lawyer has come up with another fancy way. <laughs> or someone else is going to say, you know, that makes a lot of sense. But I don't want you to just agree with extremes. I really want you to tell me what you think about it. You probably haven't thought about it much. I'm asking you to. Those two questions sometimes only do one. Mm -hmm. I get a great dialogue and I learn a lot and I prepared them for later. And I can say, remember, folks, this is da 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 da. And we talked about a jury selection. It wasn't for everybody, but all of y'all not only didn't have a problem with it, all of you thought it made perfect sense. Now you know why I brought it up. So that is a part of it. Now, then I'm going to hush and let you ask me another question. But at the end of the day, and this is just such a globally important issue to me. To me, when I get a good verdict and I got a nice defendant no one's mad at, who just, you know, wasn't, paying, wasn't doing their job on the road that day, the things that get it to me are the things we talked about together with things like this was thrust into my client's life unnaturally by no fall of Rome, or even if it's comparative, I leave out the no fall of Rome, thrust into Miss Jones' life unnaturally. Why I like that is it separates it from everybody sitting on the panel who's got an achy back and no one gave them money. I say, look, she didn't get it from rolling out of bed one day wrong and falling. She didn't get it from picking up a sack of potatoes and throwing her back out. She didn't get it because she played sports when she was younger and tore up her back. She didn't get it because she had some disease just happens like it can happen to people. One moment, she didn't have it for her whole life. And at that moment, everything changed. Someone who wasn't doing their job on the road that day, not being careful, being dangerous, slammed into her. And now for the rest of her life, she's going to live with this, was thrust into her life unnaturally by no fault of her own. Now jurors are going, that's different than what I got. Now I'm starting to, when you put it together with recognizing, so we're recognizing, we're not punishing, we're recognizing fully and completely because it was thrust in her life unnaturally by no fault of her own and its impact in her life in a significant way. You can't see it. This isn't the kind of injury you can assess externally from looking at it, but you certainly can assess it. We've got MRIs. We got this, this, and this. We got a sensible sequence of events that the fancy word is clinical correlation. And when you put all together, there's plenty of evidence that's real and it's serious. And it's always with her taking in little pieces. But those little pieces add up to a huge amount over a lifetime. And this is forever. And we don't come back in 5, 10, 15, 20 years and redo this. We get it right now or we don't get it right at all. So when you were dired out, the people that just aren't open to it. And you frame it around those kind of concepts, full recognition, thrust into life, verdict for all time, can't see it, doesn't make it any less real, taking little bits at a time that add up to a great loss over many years. Suddenly, people go, and then maybe throw in, not maybe, I would throw in like that typical car crash. I want to bring one last thing home to them where they understand how that pain is such a profound thing to have to live with. Because it's so easy. I say you're in pain. I'm in pain about something all the time. It's not the same as thrust in your life and it never, ever goes away forever because someone else did it to you. It's just not the same process. But if you don't point out it's different, it's going to feel like the same and say, quit whining. No one gave me money. 
So the last piece of that is in that car crash type case is an analogy. And that really makes it personal to the jury from something they can understand. And that's, you know, if, for example, if, if this, you know what this pain's like? It's like my client, like someone wakes up one day, slept wrong, and they got a crick in their neck. Or if it's a low back, like this case I just finished, slept wrong, and they got that burning kind of sciatica feeling running down the back because they slept wrong. You can do it either. I'll stick with the crick in your neck. Crick in their neck, and they wake up, and the first thing they say in the morning, they moan, and their wife says, what's the matter? She says, I slept wrong. Boy, my neck, I got this crick in my neck. It's stiff. Wife says, oh, I'm sorry. Hey, nah, not a big deal. It'll be gone in a while. Goes to work. Every little thing he does all day, picks up a briefcase, sets it down. Sits in his chair, hurts after a while, gets worse, stands, feels better, but after a while that hurts. Um, changing lanes, looking at a blind spot, it, it's tight and uncomfortable. All day long, comes home that day. Wife says, how was your day? Okay, but this crick in my neck, I sure hope it goes away soon. It's, it's, this is no fun. She says, honey, maybe you better go to the doctor. Nah, I don't need to go to the doctor. Goes to bed, wakes up on day two. Ugh. Wife says, what? I was hoping to be gone. Goes to work. Same thing all day. You know what he doesn't do? He doesn't call in sick. You know what else he doesn't do? He isn't walking around going, ow, 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 my neck hurts. People say, you big baby, get over. No one looking at him has a clue what's going on except his wife. I mean, they're married. They share things. Nobody else would have any idea. But now it's really starting to get on his nerves. Enough's enough. We're halfway through day two. He goes home, walks in the house. He's cranky with the kids. The wife says, what's the matter? He says, I'm sorry, this thing's, you know, really put me in a bad mood. Well, maybe you better go to the doctor. This time, maybe a little bit more about not wanting to crank in the house. Wakes up day three, wife's in brushing her teeth. She hears, hallelujah. She says, what? He goes, it's gone. Well, that's what my client's injury is like, except there is no hallelujah ever. And it didn't come because he slept wrong in the bed. Someone rammed him in the road and it's there and it's never, ever gone away. Now people remember, they go, God, I remember when the, everyone's had it happen to him. And they remember how much it was driving him batty. And they remember how glad it was when it was gone. And all of a sudden they go, well, that is a big injury, but never went away. And if someone did it to me, rather than it just happened, you better back up the brakes truck. Now they get it. So there's a lot more to it. And that was a really long answer to a very, very important global question. Thank you. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to delisi at cowanlaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at cowanlaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. And now, back to the show. One thing I really loved in your book and something I'm going to try to add to my firm's processes is it's on page 46 for people that want to go back and, and look at it. But it's on getting the client to make a list of all the quote unquote little things. Can you tell me about that? I, you know, we've got a big firm. I try a lot of cases, um, you know, every month, one at least, often four times in a month, probably average is more like two a month. And we do, as you can imagine, being a big firm, we do it all car crashes, med mal products, mass torts. I mean, we do all, I do, we even do commercial on a contingency business disputes. So I do them all, but you can imagine the biggest, like probably the biggest in most people's practice, is that car crash case. And how many times, or even in a death case, how many times do I say, all right, let's talk about the injuries. And I'm coming last minute before trial. And I would hear in the past, and I've really been pushing this and it's taking root. I would come in and someone say, well, I can't golf anymore. Can't snow ski anymore. Or in the death case. You know, my mother wasn't there when I got married to have my first child. And I hear those things. And first of all, no one gives a shit about golfing and snowing, skiing. Even the golfers don't. They, in a lawsuit, that's the damnedest thing. I used to think, well, I'll get golfers, they'll care. They don't, they say, oh, it ain't, that ain't real money in a, lawsuit, in a lawsuit, even though if you took it away from them, it'd be a big deal. So, I, so, and I'm like, all right, but surely this is, look, I got a bad back. It's where it comes from. I know what it's like to live with it. My wife's even worse. 
So I know the reality of day to day, moment by moment, it's always there. No one did it to me or her. So, but you can empathize. In the daughter who lost her mother. Well, so let's say your mom, who you had this wonderful relationship, you've had two children in your life and got married once. So the entire 60 years, 50 years left, we got three things matter to you, losing your mom. You talk about diminishing the reality of the loss. Um, so you either diminish it and or mock it if you say, I can't golf. And I'm not saying you can't bring up golf, but it can't be everything. It's got to be a throw in, you know, and then you got to avoid dire with people, by the way, if you're going to do like golf. Tell me about your passions, your hobbies, the things you love. You really get a great deal of pleasure. Someone else may say, what's the big deal? You know, knitting and fishing and golf, whatever. Get, get them. Then so in closing, keep track who says what. In closing, you know, not everybody golfs, but to him it was a big loss. It would be like someone who loved crocheting. You got a crocheter on your jury. You know, it's, a, it's just a – but having said that, that's how to make that better. But that isn't your damages. It is all the little things. And you know what happens? Sit your client down and say, tell me all the little things. You're going to whiff. You'd be lucky to get two. Let them go to depot and don't go through the process. And what do you have? A transcript locked down of the only thing bothering them is they can't golf and ski. They golf once a week and they ski one week a year because they're from Florida, Texas. You got to go somewhere. And now you get up a trial and make up and they start listing more and they try to impeach them. You didn't say any of those things. So the new process, because I just got tired of facing that, was give them a homework assignment. Bring them in your office, or you can talk to them on the phone. And say, but I, I say give them like one of the little moleskins. Give them the thing to keep them in so it's formal, so they don't end up not doing it. And say, and explain to them what I just explained. No one cares about this. I'm not saying we're not going to talk about it. I know it matters to you. But you are turning your injury into nothing compared to what it is. And what I need you to do is I want you to go home. I want you to keep this with you at all times for in pick a time, two, three days a week. Week's probably best, but, you know, some time period. And I want you to think about throughout the day, every I don't care how little and petty it is. This may never see the light of day. I need to know. Every little thing that comes up with you where you notice, not just where you don't do something, but where you do it, but you do it different or where you had to stop and think, I'm going to do it. And there's a decent chance it's going to ramp my pain up. My pilot light pain is going to go to flare up pain, but I'm going to do it anyhow because it's important to me and I'm I'm not going to stop doing. So every time in your mind, you have even a boom, split second, do it or don't do it knowing you're going to pay a price if you do it. Even though you're going to do it, I want you to list it. And then if you have a consequence and you got a little more pain, even if it was only sore, it hurt for five minutes more, write it down. Every little thing you don't do, every little thing you do do, but you had to think about it, and every little thing you do, but you made a slight adjustment to it. Every time you've thought about it, if it pops in your head, gosh, I wish I didn't have this. And I remember when I didn't have this. It's hard for me to remember when I didn't have any of those. I want you to write them all down. It's a homework assignment. Then get them back in and go over the homework. And there's going to be, trust me, you're going to have stuff you never want to tell the jury. It does sound petty. But within there is going to be the real story of the impact of this on your client's life. It changes everything. They go to depot. And the defense lawyer says, all right, tell me how this is impacted. And about 15 minutes later, he's going, damn it, we need to settle this guy. (laughs) I mean, you, they're miserable. They're miserable. And you go through and throw out the ones that you don't like. Say, these are the best ones. And then have them hand write them out separately on a piece of paper or something. Say, look them over so it's fresh. When you give them the homework assignment, though, here's a critical part, because they won't understand what I just described is helpful, but you need to add to it some real life examples. And look, I don't coach witnesses to make stuff up. But I also don't want them to eliminate stuff. You're never going to even get in trouble ethically for making sure the truth comes out. So it's not giving them answers. It's giving them examples so they can go get their own real examples. And I tell them, look, these may not have anything to do with your life. I'm simply giving you some examples of what other people have told me. And then I go through. You know, I've heard. 
And I tell them, look, I've had problems. I have problems. So I know from my, oh, some of these are my own life. But you used to get out of bed. You just kind of hopped up. Now you kind of roll out slowly and you got a little routine how you get out of bed. When you brush your teeth, you switch from a, a some people sw- actually have switched from a regular brush manual to an electric. And they're very careful when they're brushing teeth. If someone says something to them, don't turn your head while you're brushing the teeth because that can kink them up. Changing lanes in the car, looking at a blind spot. You have to can't stay as long and you're quick because if you stay too long term, it may fire fire up the pain worse. Sitting, standing, and, and just come up with talk for five minutes about examples and say none of those may be you. Some of them may be, but those are the kinds of things I'm looking for. And you'll see them go, oh, they'll interrupt you, by the way. Oh, I got that. And let me tell you, mine's a little different. Say, so, fine, write them all down. Then meet with them again after you've done all that right before their depot. And then when they go to test, you get up an opening and you give them a little tidbit of it. You're going to hear these kind of things. And suddenly jurors go, you know what it's like the difference of? You go tell some of my clients had 30 injections, pain injections for, you know, for back pain. Over the course of four years getting the trials, had 30 injections. That sounds like a lot. Put up a little illustration of a human back or body that shows the back and put in 30 needles. It looks like a porcupine. I do that in, in, in any case where we have a bunch of pain management. And you put that diagram up and people go, illustration up, people go, whoa, this is the same thing. It, you're, you're going from saying, I heard all the time, to let me tell you how it impacts my life. And it's and here's the key. It does not impact their life by them no longer jogging, no longer walking. No, this $2.62 million verdict, you want to, You think at this age, you know, we get older and we don't make mistakes, we make mistakes. I, I asked a question, I was on a roll, it felt good, and then I went, idiot, why'd you ask that? Yeah. But I had her on the stand and I said, now, ma'am, here's the surveillance. And I, played, I always play the surveillance with them. Because look, if they're caught in a big lie in surveillance, I don't need to worry about surveillance. I ain't going. I don't. I'm not a mercenary. I, I am a. This is a calling to me. I got to believe they're hurt, and I don't like going over if someone's a big old liar. Now, if they got all nervous, screwed it up, and they're really, really hurt, that's different. But the true, someone who's making it up, I'm throwing them out of my damn office. So, having said that, I had my client on the stand. They had the surveillance, and then there was no aha moment, no gotcha. It was just you know taking a big case of water off a, off of a cart on the lower part of a shopping cart, putting it in her car, and she's got a low back injury, and the damn thing's pretty heavy. So, you know, but she does it. I, I know not to pick that kind of shit up. I do it all the time with my back, and I think most people get it if, you, if you're not scared. Of it. But I got her on the stand, and she also, they didn't film it, but she told them in the deposition that she'd gone on a 5K charity walk, and they actually – got her time. Somehow they were ordered somewhere. And she walked at a pretty damn good clip. And so that was a big part of the case. So we just went right at it. I got her on the stand. I said, by the way, I told the jury that you did a 5K walk. Is that true? Yeah. And you went at a pretty good pace. Is that true? I did. But what we don't know is what did you have to do afterwards? Did you have to go lay on a heat patch? She goes, I don't remember, but I don't think so. I'm like, I, <laughs> I hadn't prepped for that. I got free yeah. and then it got worse. And I said, by the way, did you ever say you couldn't go on a 5K walk? No. Could you do it again? Yes. In fact, I have. (laughs) But you know what my theme became with her? They're portraying her to be this big phony, faking it, making it up. You've met her. I don't think any of you think she's a dummy. If she's faking it, she's the dumbest faker on the planet. Watch how many times, I'm going to count, how many times the defense cites the things she said in their closing. Is that a faker? Is that a faker? She just tell it like it is. Even I told him, remember I asked that? And then when I did, I said, why did I ask that? I said, you know what? Her answer was just true. She lets the chips fall where they may. Their story doesn't fit. So my, I, I diverted off on that. But the point is, when you get up with your client and they start telling all those little things, it's not the things they can't do. With that herniated disc, the reason the defense thinks they're going to win every time is they think we're going to try the wrong case. We're going to try the, this is an injury like cane pain. You limp and can see it, and you can't do 90% of what you used to do. It's not that kind of case. Never was. It's a, you can't judge a book by its cover case. 
That doesn't mean the content doesn't tell a horror story. You just got to tell it truthfully, honestly, and frame it to where each other's aren't looking for something it's not. And once they understand it and they understand having to live with these constant little decisions. Do, and by the way, when you talk about, you know, what about Trump jurors? You know what I say? You know what everyone believes in, especially a Trump supporter, your rights and freedoms. So speak the language. They have taken my client's freedom from living life without having to make all these endless many choices, do or don't do, knowing there may be a consequence if you do. And if you don't, you've already given up that right to do it. And people are you're damn right, that's a big deal, because it is. Trump jurors aren't bad jurors. You just may have to talk to them a little different than you would if you're talking to Nancy Pelosi jurors. But it doesn't mean they don't have empathy and they're not humans and they're not smart and they're not going to be fair. Just be smart about the language you choose. You know, I just had a race. I'm going on a different one, but I had a race. But this lady, we just got the verdict, was African-American. By the way, I asked her. I said, I say African-American. I have some friends of mine that are African-American lawyers, and they say, Mitnick, don't say African-American. Say what, say black. It's okay. And, and, and so I said, is it okay? So I said, yeah, just say black. So my client's black. You can see her. at all white jury, conservative area, bunch of engineers, tough place. And I worried about it. But I needed to ask them about it. And I was, no one's going to admit it. But I thought, if I'm going to talk about it, I'm going to talk in a language that's understood. So I said, you know, you can see my client's black. We're all white. I, need, I said, I hate to ask this question. I'm almost chickened out and didn't ask it. But this is an American court. It ain't a place to be scared. So I need to ask you if I'm worried about it. You know, because of my earlier question, we'll be talking about a lot of money. You know, because of some of my earlier questions, they're suggesting she's not really hurt. And you put all that together, some folks may react differently. Just remember, I asked about Morgan and Morgan and my law firm advertising. And how many of you think you have to keep a closer eye on me? I'm in a group advertising lawyer. You might have to keep a closer eye on me. So it's no different here. It's just a different group. And you may feel you keep a closer eye on me because of the, what's coming with the conflicts and the evidence. I got to ask because the, the one side's evidence may have a, may have a leg up. And, and so, and here's what I know. This is where I picked up the right language for this group. I said, the courtroom is not a place to worry about being politically correct, nor is it a place to cancel out the truth. So I'm saying cancel culture, political correctness. I really fooled myself into thinking there were some people going to say yes, they did. But I think it made a big difference because when I finished it, I said, now, is anybody offended that I asked that? And no one raised their hand. And I said, does everybody understand why I really needed to, why I asked it? And they all went, made me feel a hell of a lot better because I've been scared of that question my whole life. I finally asked it. And um, and then I wrapped it up with, said, and I need to ask each of you. We all talk about equal justice, justice for all. It's constitutional. And we know lady justice has the blindfold. It doesn't mean she's blind. It means she's blind to these kind of things. How many of you think those concepts are more than just words, but this is part of being an American and it's important to stand up for it and it's worth fighting for it. How many of you feel that way? And I, it was the thing of beauty. Those, you, you could, it, people's voices cracked over. Mine did. And so, you know, and then I got to closing and I, I did not circle back and say, remember now and shame them. I thought mm -hmm. that would have been a huge mistake. What I did do is say, remember, we talked about race during jury selection. I am so glad we did that because now we can all have peace of mind that this verdict is going to be based on the merits and only the merits. And we can do all American justice. And it just felt so good. And I, I am, I love, you know, I'm, I, I, we all love to brag about our verdicts. Um, but not long ago, within a year, I tried virtually the identical case in another very conservative place with an African American, see, I did it again with a black client and all white jury, and I didn't do it. And we lost. Ouch. I don't know that's why we lost, but I went away saying you're never, I've always said, why ask it? No one is going to own up to it. And I now realize you ask it because a screaming racist, hopefully you don't, you get them for some other cause. But that subtle layer, I believe calling it out puts it to bed. So I did. I do that now. 
So in any event, that somehow I got on that from homework assignment. <laughs> the homework assignment, I trust me, it will pay dividends in the way of getting full justice. And all of us are heartbroken when we fall short of that. Thank you. I'm definitely going to put that to use. Uh, another thing that I've just makes your book a little different than some of the others uh, that I've read is just the real practical. You are really good at coming up with words. I mean, forever injury instead of permanent injury, uh, picked and paid for opinion witnesses instead of defense experts. Doubt is not an out. Uh, I could keep going and going and going. You have read my stuff. I have, and I've yeah. used your stuff in, in uh, real trials, and it works. Uh, first of all, why do words matter, and then how do you come up with the words that you use? All right, that's good. That's a fun one. I, I'm, I am a word nerd. People say, what's your hobby? My hobby, really, is problem solving and lawsuits and coming up with the perfect words. We don't have to worry about every word that comes out of our mouth. For goodness sake, we'd be tongue-tied. But those anchoring words, those key words that we build our case around, be careful. It's just I hear, and I'll tell you a, a system I came up with not that long ago that is fun, and it really helps. I, I've, I've been good at it for years because I've been doing it at years, but even being natural to me, my little system is speeding up me getting me the right words. Nothing I'd rather do is be trying to figure out the right word in a thesaurus. I, I start having ideas. I take an erasable board, and I just start throwing them up. It looks like a beautiful mind, that madness of Russell Crowe in that thing. No one else can read it, I, and I look at it half the time I can't. But it, I just, it's a way to get it out of my head when I'm up doing that rather than at a computer or on a legal pad. Don't know why. That's just the way my brain works. But when I see a word and I go, that's not the best word, I just put a TH and circle it. No means the SARS. When I'm done, it's like Christmas because I look up and say I got three THs up there. That means I get to chase these words down. It's fun. <laughs> um, and those words matter. They make such a here's, – here's a, a, another simple example. How many times have we, and I'm saying we include me, said talking to an opposing expert? So your opinion is, or you believe. Well, now what we've just communicated, not so subtly, is our own personal conclusion is they really believe it. It's just an honest disagreement over opinions. It is not you making it up. Now, sometimes that's what we want to communicate. If I got some sweet little old lady who says, you know, I, there was a stop sign and it was a straight road, broad daylight and no obstacles. And she says she looked left and we weren't there. And she pulled out, boom, we had a collision. I'm not, here's, here's what, let me go back to the expert and I'll say why I wouldn't do it with that lady. With the expert, what instead of saying, so you say, I'm sorry, you believe, your opinion, if I understand this, you say, you say. Now, if you want to really juice it up, you can say, you would have the jury believe. You allege. But honestly, the simplest one is you say. Now, I'm not communicating he believes it. I'm communicating that's what you're saying. And there's an underlying classy hint. You're saying it, but you know it isn't so without ever saying it. So it's simply changing the word from you believe your opinion is to you say. I'm not validating he believes it inadvertently through the wording I chose. Now that sweet little old lady, I'm not going to cross-examine her and say, ma'am, you say he wasn't there. I mean, but just say, don't be mean to her. She's, you know, she can't see good. She's older. I say, now, ma'am, I understand. It's your opinion, your conclusion. You, I just go on to say it because it is her conclusion. She's not lying. So you say you pulled out. I said, okay. But can we just be clear about it? I don't say you say. You're, as you recall it, there was she wasn't there. And you say you, were, you seem to recall looking. But can, I just want to establish a couple of facts and we'll be done. Broad daylight, wasn't it? Yeah. Straight road, not one of those big curves. You couldn't see them coming. Oh, yeah. And um, there were no trees hanging down, blocking your view, no bushes. No. So you had a clear view straight up the road for a long distance. Yep. And I understand you say, I looked, he wasn't there. But can we agree? You pulled out, bam, there was a conclusion. Yeah, like that, right? Yeah. Thank you, man. Then you just tell him in closing, you know, she just mistaken. She's at fault. So I wouldn't do you say with her. That's rude. But most are witnesses. We want to say you say. So what is the key to these key words? And I really want to emphasize, do not drive yourself crazy picking the right words on everything you say. I mean, it'll, 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 you'll end up a stutter. Don't do that. It's just these key words, anchor words we're going to use over and over that frame out our case. 
This is the little system. I was watching some show on Netflix called um, Broad Church. Good show, by the way. It's one of these British mysteries. And they lived in some town on one of those cliffs like Dover Shores. And it just dropped off and rocks all on the bottom. And we're watching it. And we live in Florida on the beach. And my wife says, well, no one would call that a beach. And when she said it, I went, hold on. I paused the thing. I said, you just hit on something big. I said, what would we call it? And so I said, I, I got I got an epiphany. And I ended, we didn't even watch the show that night. We finished it the next night. And here's what it is. There are words that I call activator words and inert words. And I just made it up following that because they capture, again, I'm talking about words. So I captured some words that captured my meaning pretty quick. Inert, we know it means an activator. Actor means it activates action. Inert means it's ambiguous. There are words that are inert, meaning it's got two different meanings to different people to have a reliable reaction from a jury. And activator words have not 100% accuracy, but with a high level of, of confidence are going to activate a particular meaning. But there's more to it. Then there is, all right, if it is an activator word, is it a positive activator or a negative activator? Another word, classic example is, say, an accident. We all know, don't say accidents. Why? Accidents happen. What do we say instead? Crash. Why? Crashes make you cringe. Well, both those words are activator. Activator crash is ooh, bad, harmful. Accident is no one's at fault. So both are activator. One's a negative activator for us in a lawsuit. The other's a positive activator because what we're after are words that will reliably tap into a memory and evoke a certain outpour of an emotion. It doesn't have to be anger. It's just, it starts momentum in a direction we want it to go. And it's in the kind of state of mind we want. So there is negative and positive activator words. One activates some emotion that's going to outflow or memory we're not wanting. The other is we do want. So if you take that simple principle, and you take just a couple examples, like um, you say, following too close. Well, you know what? That is inert. One person is going to say, God damn it, they're following too close. It's dangerous. The next person is going to think about driving down the highway at rush hour and everyone's bumper to bumper traffic. That's why we call it bumper to bumper traffic. It's too ambiguous. I can't control or predict how one person is going to react in the next. If I say, tailgating, that's a not inert. That's activator. Everybody's, no, you say tailgating and it makes your blood boil. Riding your bumper, that's another one. There is no question people are going to react and how they're going to react, and it's the way you want them to react that the defendant was doing it. Trucker, it's inert. One person's going to think, you know, a big sand truck blowing by here in Florida, pebbling my car up. Someone else is going to think as a kid going by going, doing your hand, and they go, honk, honk. They, they're the one make sure we get the eggs and ice cream on time. So, and it's a hard job. So instead of that, you can say, you know, my way or the highway, road bully, road hog. Everybody knows that is an activator and is going in the direction that I want it to go. So if you simply take the words that are going to be important to you, grab a thesaurus. I've got probably five thesaurus apps on my phone. I'll, actually, on my phone, I use one now. I'll go if I'm really striking out, I may go to the others. I got a good one the last year. It's called Word Hippo. Word Hippo. It's a real, I don't know why it's so much better. It just is. I rarely have to go beyond it. If you're on an iPad, get Word Flex, like flex your muscles. And it is the best I've ever seen. But for whatever reason, you cannot get it on your phone or a laptop. It only works on an iPad. I, I think they're losing a lot of money. But um, And then I always have a bunch of hardbacks. You know, I've got even got the 20-volume Oxford English Dictionary, and I pay for subscription every year, 250 because they've got an unbelievable thesaurus. But it's a lot of it's highbrow stuff. Word Hippo and Word Flex will do it for you. And just say, look, I need the right word. This is what came to mind. 
but is it really the word I want? And you'll find as you start chasing a thesaurus, it'll switch you over to another word that's really a little different word. Then you plug that in and chase it. And you end up realizing not only did I get a better word, I was a little off the mark in the word I was starting with conceptually. It's fun and it's so powerful to use those right words when you're talking to a jury. You know, it's like, here's a simple one. This is so simple. And I catch, I, I tried a case recently with a fantastic lawyer, someone I'd hire for my family. But he did, I cringe because I, I know I've done it and I tried to not do it. But he was up and he was talking about things that the defendant shouldn't do, kind of rules of the road, Rick Friedman kind of rules of the road. He typed stuff on cross. And he said, you're not supposed to do that. And you're not supposed to. And I thought, you're putting the jurors into the defendant's shoes. Don't say you because it's easy to say. I, I do it all the time. I'm right. And I go, and I go, don't, not you. They, they aren't supposed to. Not you. As soon as you say you, the juror's feeling it to the person you're criticizing. When you say they, you're criticizing someone else. They're better than that. So those kind of little things make, make a huge difference. Not because you said it wrong once. No one gives a damn. Because of the kind of things get repeated. If you say accident, 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 that's a problem. If you slip and say accident, so what? But if you say crash, crash, or collision, collision, crash, you're, you're staking out your territory. But it's a conceptual change that fits right into the same thing. Just a, It's a phrase instead of a word. You're taking on a defense expert. Now, if you're taking on that guy in a car crash, they hire every time who says the exact same thing in every case. There's no herniation. It's all degeneration. Your position is he, he's a liar, and you don't want to say liar. But, you know, I go after him hard. You can't believe him. What he's saying doesn't make a lick of sense. He does it all the time. That's okay with that expert. But now, how many times do we face that expert? You, you go, oh, my God, it looks like a million bucks. Genteel, nice, classy, huge credentials, not overly selling their case, responsive, not argumentative. I see it more in med mouth than car crashes. But, I, you know, I just faced one in a damn car crash that he was a biomechanical MD guy. It, of course, we want the jerk, not the really likable. But when you got the likable, got a med mouth case, someone's coming all the way down from Harvard to testify in Texas. And you know they're making money. They're world-renowned. They got a CV this thick. They travel the world teaching. They wrote the book on the subject. No one is going to buy. They came all the way down from Harvard to, to Austin to lie through their teeth because they got paid 20 grand. It just doesn't fit. And you're going to turn the jurors off who like the guy. So one little switch. He got carried away by the competitive spirit. Everyone does that. Doesn't make them a bad person. But I say, and I'll do it in opening. Best place to start across with somebody that you, you're not going to knock down hard is don't let them get up on their high horse to start with. Let's have a fight on the ground together. I'm going to keep you from ever putting your foot in the in the stirrup and slinging your leg over. We're not getting on that high horse yet. Opening statement. They're going to bring this guy. I, I, the, the real case. I see, the guy was from Johns Hopkins. And that's all they wanted to talk about. And I said, they're going to bring this doctor down from Johns Hopkins. And you know, Johns Hopkins, folks, the Johns Hopkins, not some branch, the one. And man, does he have credentials. Man, does this guy talk good. He looks like a big, but kind of makes me mad. He's got this beautiful, all his hair on his head. And he's, you know, on top of that, he's got a little British accent that makes me more charming. And they're going to bring him in here to testify. And here's what the evidence is going to show. Not that he sold his soul over a little money. Not a little, it's quite a bit, but the evidence is to show he's gotten carried away by the competitive spirit. And I may work it in if I'm afraid the judge is going to shut it down as argument and just do it in voir dire in general. Don't talk about him. Then you can say, remember, we talked about in voir dire how some witnesses can get lost. They, 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 they get carried away by the competitive spirit. They're hired by one side. They're being paid by one side. They meet with one side. And there's nothing wrong with meeting with a witness, but they do. And it just becomes natural. You want to be a good team player. And he's saying things to you now that just don't add up. For example, and now, and I said, you'll know he gets here. So Dr. Johns, I started calling him Dr. Johns Hopkins. They actually approached the bench and objected, say, I need to quit, that, 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 I, that I am. 
that, that I am trying being derogatory. I said, Your Honor, I'll make a deal. They don't say he's from John Hopkins. I won't call him Dr. John Hopkins. <laughs> and they actually, it was working so much, they thought it was derogatory because I'd call him Mr. John Hopkins. But the point is, I said, you're going to know when he gets here. Beautiful hair, this, this. They're going to call him and he's got a little bit unusual name. It's so-and-so. I wrote it out. When you hear, call your next witness. He says, we call Dr. So-and-so. That'll be the guy I've been talking about. You're going to be impressed. I'm impressed. But at the end of the day, is what he's saying add up? It doesn't. Not even close. Because he got carried away by the competitive spirit. Jackson, argumentative. Probably. I would draw it. Sorry. <laughs> so the point is, rather than treat him as liar, liar, pants on fire, kind of like the difference between the old lady, you switch it over to got carried away by the competitive spirit. I got pages and pages more, but we're already over an hour recording. Oh, so I just, sorry. Uh, That's on me. I'm sorry. I'm No, no, don't be sorry. Like I said, I've got tons of notes. I'm ready to put this in action. So instead of reading about things in your book, Deeper Cuts, uh, which I have and everyone else should have, you can get it from trialdice.com. I, I want to ask you a couple questions that aren't addressed in the book, sure. uh, at least not that I've read. One is you know, you're coming in trying cases, uh, and, and I'm doing this more and more, trying cases that someone else has worked up. How do you get up to speed and learn the story and, and get your deep, passionate belief in the righteousness of your client's cause on a case someone else worked up? It starts with me telling myself this simple truth. I am at a disadvantage not having rode the roller coaster and not knowing the nuances. But on the flip side, there's an advantage because I'm going to have it wash over me in one overwhelming wave like a tsunami just like the jury is. And I'm almost certainly going to react to it differently than back when I used to work my own cases up because the cake was baked in my mind. That's the case we're trying. I come in it and more times than not, I adjust it substantially from where the lawyer was going to go with it. Not because I'm smarter than them, because I'm seeing it in this big mess of stuff. And I realize you have reached certain conclusions aren't going to be that easy to reach the way a jury's getting it like this. So in the advantage is the defense lawyer usually gets up and wants to, you know, call a mistrial because this isn't the case he came to defend. You know, I change it enough. Their, their opening is in shambles because I've, I've changed it. So there is an advantage coming. And the system to me is there are no shortcuts. I got when it's coming, it depends how complex the case is. If it's a fairly straightforward car crash, I can get ready, start getting ready on Friday and be ready Monday morning. But I need a trial partner who's worked the case up and knows every nuance. And I drive batty with a million emails and phone calls over the weekend. And I keep saying, what about this? And what about, because I know if I don't know this, I'm going to start building something this way and it's going to be built wrong because that, that fit great until I learned this fact. So I just, you got it. When you come in late, you got to check your pride at the door, give yourself confidence that Whatever I'm losing and not having learned every every piece, I'm winning with learning it like the jury is, and then ask the questions and keep asking and don't worry about being a pest. And I'm down to the last minute. You know, we're in the courtroom. We've got the jury pick, and the judge is about to come in, and we're going to be doing openings. And I'm leaning over, and I think of one more thing. I said, by the way. <laughs> and they go, yeah. And that's, I don't. then sometimes they go, I don't know. I said, let me ask the client. I ask the client. The other thing is, I always make time. I shouldn't say always. There have been exceptions where I couldn't. But I always try to and rarely don't meet the client. And I don't mean, nice to meet you. Let me, I'll talk to you on the break. I got to connect with them some in my heart. So I want to spend a little time with them at some point. And if we, something can be Zoom. But just, A, I want them to be comfortable with me. And B, I want to start feeling like I know them. Because my pri I'm different than some plaintiff's lawyers. My primary motivation is, it's one of two things. You either are driven by white hot fire to get justice, or you're driven by white hot fire to prevent injustice. I'm the prevent injustice guy. I hate bullies. I hate them pulling off, acting as if my client's a big phony when they're not. I hate some doctor getting away with wrecking someone's life just because he's got an MD title and all that. So I'm kind of the anti-bully. I fight injustice. I don't need to meet the client for that. But as I've gotten older, I realize you can't be all the one or the other. 
If you aren't both, you're missing something too profound. So I have a big empathetic heart. I cry a lot of tear up in a lot of closing arguments. And I hadn't met the client till the day before trial. But they get under my skin quickly. But I got to give my chance, them a chance to get under my skin. So I, I make the time, if at all possible, to get to know them, not during the trial, before I step up. Because now you're now you, quickly I can connect to them. And now I'm not only fighting injustice, I'm fighting for someone that I care deeply about, even though it happened quick. Now, when you try a case someone else has worked up, do you do the whole trial yourself? Do you split up parts of it? How do you split, do that? Split. And it'll depend on the age of the lawyer, the comfort of the lawyer, what we do. Some of them, we just split them down the middle. Um, some of them I do. The typical model is I pick the jury almost always. I close almost always. Sometimes we split close. But usually I pick them, I close. I like to do opening. Sometimes we go back and forth a little on who's going to open. And they usually do the directs unless, you know, like it's a client that's closer to my age and I feel I'm better to do them. Um, but otherwise, they do our, wit, our experts, our fact witnesses. I do most of the crosses, if not all. Now, if it's a longer trial and we got three days of fact witnesses or, or experts on our side, I'm not going to go three days and do nothing. I will take a, one of those witnesses to stay engaged. But in a five-day trial, I typically pick it, open it, pass the baton, and then pick up crosses, and I got a heavy load at the end cross to close. But like I said, I tried a case not long ago with a, a lawyer in our firm who does the same thing I do. I'm now not the only one that we call trial specialist, uh, Brian McLean. And we've got several of them now, Rick Block, and they're just so such fabulous lawyers. But I tried one with McLean, and we split close. He did. He was in it before I was in it. So he did the front end. I did the rebuttal. And and you wonder how that's going to work. I, we, we ended up. But anyhow, I thought it worked really, really well. And so there are all kinds of ways to do it. The only thing I will add this. My very first suit against a cigarette company, I was going to pick the jury and my trial partner was going to open. And we had um, a, a highly well-known jury consultant, Eric Oliver, a very, very, very smart guy and very opinionated. He and I bumped heads some, but he wasn't, when he opened his mouth, I, when, even I disagreed, I always listened. And there were plenty of times he changed my mind. He is a brilliant guy. But in any event, he's, um, he says, all right, so you're picking the jury. Let's talk about your opening. I said, well, Greg's going to do the opening. He's a fantastic lawyer, dear friend of mine. I knew the details of the case better because he was running the cigarette cases. And Eric Oliver said, you've lost your mind. You're the one who spent all that time in jury selection, establishing rapport. They know who you are. Now you're going to get the guy who's had his head down taking notes about him, stand up with no relationship and, and do opening the, the most critical part of the case after Bordier. And I had done many where I picked and someone else opened. And so I ended up opening. And I'm not sure it's as big a deal as that but I know it is a deal. So I usually like to open ever since then, even though it's heavy lifting to go right from Bordier to opening and the other lawyer knows the case better because I took Eric's advice to heart. Now, sometimes we split it up and gotten great results, but it just, when he said it, I thought it's not like you're losing your mind doing it. I don't think it's that big, but I do think it matters. And I, it made perfect sense. So I like to, like to open, and I do believe deeply minds are made up after opening statements. And I'm wired to destroy the defense's case in opening without trying the defense's case. And that's not a skill set everyone's developed as much as I have by being a fanatic about it. So I typically will open. Yeah, it's always been my struggle. So, you know, you want to bring someone along, they need to get experience. Plus, it's, it's nice not to do all the heavy lifting. Yeah, you um, get a break. And, you know, again, it's when they're younger, you find places for them to throw them in and get them in there. And but, if you know, at the end of the day, it's a you know, you got a client you're responsible for. And if it's a witness, it's win or losing a difficult witness and they're still learning cross. You know, you, we got an obligation to do them. Doesn't mean they need to sit on the bench the whole trial. They can get in and do it. And the more skilled they are, the more we just that one I just did with McLean. We just truly split it down in the middle. We actually did violate the rule. I. I picked the jury. He opened. We split the clothes. We split the crosses. And so, 
So I could talk to you for hours more, and hopefully I'll get you back on another time because just I've got several pages of notes from going through uh, deeper cuts. Uh, so since we, you know, have a limited time on any given podcast, I'd first encourage all my listeners go to trialguides.com if you don't already have it. Get deeper cuts, and of course, don't eat the bruises. Uh, with all the work I know you put into it, if enough people buy the book, you might get up to 15, 20 cents an hour for the time. <laughs> yeah, that's a labor of love, not a labor of cash. You also have a great podcast yourself, Mitnick's Monthly Brush Cokes. It's on all the podcast apps. And then you also have a, a listserv where you put out tips. Can you tell us how to get on yeah. that? Yeah. What happened is during the COVID, I couldn't go to New York and film my, we were, it's audio podcast. And I couldn't get up there because COVID, everything was shut down. And I had more time on my hands because trials were shut down. I had all this stuff I wanted to get out. And I knew lawyers had more time. And I thought, this is a perfect time to get some of these new ideas out there. And I was frustrated. And so I came up with, instead of, I call it brush strokes is my audio podcast. I call it at home, but not alone brush strokes. And they were, I just would type them up. My audio ones, I try to keep them to 15 minutes. So people can listen to them quickly. Same concept. One page. To, I think the longest was three page, but most of them are one to one half page. And it's just snippets of a trial strategy that I really think is worth pulling out and writing. And I sit, was sending them out every week. And then now trials are back up. It's more like every two, three weeks, maybe once a month. Um, but if you want them, all you got to do, they're free. Um, if you email me at kmitnick and it's M-I-T-N-I-K, not C-K. It's not like the first name Nick. K-M-I-T-N-I-K at for the people, F-O-R, the people.com. And simply say, I enjoyed it or whatever. And would you please add me to your listserv? And if you don't mind, add onto the email my assistant, Mary Arnold, and it's M Arnold at for the people.com. It just saves me having to forward them to her. She will put you on for all new ones and catch you up if, and put on if you haven't been on, say, and I'd like to have the old ones. I think I'm up to 50 now. She'll send you the old ones and then you'll be on for all the new ones. And that to me is good for my heart because I just like I know Michael believes in her. He wouldn't be spending the time he spends on this fabulous broadcast he does. We're, we're cut from that cloth that really believe in a rising tide lifts all boats. And we are doing this because it, it, it gets us something. We're doing this because someone did it for us at one point in our career. And we're called to as best we can to pass on any ideas we have for other people to see if they want to use them because we're all fighting the same common enemy, which is injustice. So, so if you want on it, send me the email. We'll quickly add you to it. And I would love to come back on and talk some more, Michael. This has been fun. We definitely will. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Thank you for joining us on Trial Lawyer Nation. I hope you enjoyed our show. If you'd like to receive updates, insider information, and more from Trial Lawyer Nation, sign up for our mailing list at triallawyernation.com. You can also visit our episodes page on the website for show notes and direct links to any resources in this or any past episode. To help more attorneys find our podcast, please like, share, and subscribe to our podcast on any of our social media outlets. If you'd like access to exclusive, plaintiff lawyer-only content, in live monthly discussions with me, send a request to join the Trial Lawyer Nation Insider Circle Facebook group. Thanks again for tuning in. I look forward to having you with us next time on Trial Lawyer Nation. Each year, the law firm of Cowan Rodriguez Peacock pays millions of dollars in co-counsel fees to attorneys nationwide on trucking and commercial vehicle cases. If you have an injury case involving death or catastrophic injuries and would like to partner with our firm, please contact us. You can reach Delisi Friday by calling 210-941-1301 or send an email to Delisi at CowanLaw.com. That's D-E-L-I-S-I at CowanLaw.com. She will coordinate a time for Michael Cowan to speak with you in person or by phone to discuss the case in detail and see where we can add value in a partnership. This podcast has been hosted by Michael Cowan and is not intended to, nor does it create the attorney-client privilege between our host, guest, and any listener for any reason. Content from the podcast is not to be interpreted as legal advice. All thoughts and opinions expressed herein are only those from which they came.